TMT. Tonight, a major TV event. Part one of the story of a remote Dutch trading post that would become the armpit of the world. It captured our imagination and held our dreams close to its breasts, gently drowning us in a milky discharge. It is the site of some of mankind's most grandiose achievements and also our society's most squalid and depraved debaucheries. A history of liberty. Major support for this documentary is brought to you by the Bank of Liberty and the Public Broadcasting Corporation, where our budget is cut every year to pay for more bombs. If you take a look at the microcosm that is Liberty City, millions of people, a collective consciousness but utterly alone in a crowd, a million souls crying out to be heard, piled on top of each other like kittens in a bag all wanting to kill each other or suck from society's teat. It is a city with so much history. It is the history of the modern world, particularly for people who can't use a map and like sweeping generalizations. A history of decadence, a history of corruption, a history of liberty. On September 4th, 1609, Horatio Humboldt, an English explorer hired by the Dutch to find a new place to sell weed, steered his trusty ship into the mouth of a great river, the Humboldt, which he wrote in his log. It is a strange and fortuitous coincidence that lush future site of commerce coincidentally shares the same name as me, for the locals call it the Humboldt. Honestly. That being said, looking through contemporary journals, even then the Humboldt River was 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 a polluted mess. The Chickasaw Indians would shit and, and and piss right in the river. It wasn't safe to swim in. With that knowledge, it makes it much easier to ignore the awful genocide and epic larceny our forefathers committed and talk about big ideas in grandiose terms and hope we get book deals. Horatio Humboldt had stumbled into the natural harbor that would become the greatest sociological experiment the world had ever seen, to determine if all the people in the world could live together in a single place. The answer is, of course, no. Liberty City was founded by the Dutch, and all the Dutch cared about was appearing to be purveyors of liberal values. But all they really cared about was pimping women and getting high. They were, in effect, well, I guess the first rappers. They wanted to find a place where they could party and kill people. Knowing this, it does make the act of highway robbery that our forefathers committed with regards to the Dutch a lot easier to forget, and, and we simply mask it in patriotic foundation myths. Unlike other cities in the New World, founded to facilitate new forms of religious persecution by lunatics who'd been run out of Europe by liberals, Liberty City was founded not to promote religious intolerance, but instead the other central tenant of Western European society, getting rich off of other people's work. You have to understand that when the Europeans arrived, uh, the people that met them were savages. Can you imagine landing in a foreign land and being surrounded by men in loincloths? It's sort of hard to concentrate on fending off bubonic plague or, or sleeping with your pretty little 14-year-old wife when there are savages with no clothes running around. Luckily, we had a few tricks up our sleeve for dealing with them. When Liberty City was founded at the beginning of the modern age, it quickly expanded its ego and learned to hate everyone else. Cities that were 3,000 years old couldn't hold a candle to the undisputed, self-appointed capital of the world. Oh, the maps were really, really shitty back then. I mean, I don't know if it was the drink or the scurvy or the raging syphilis passed about by the town bike, but look at this map! It's like a Spaniard with polio painted it. It's one of the reasons people took so long to get anywhere. I mean, I mean, the shitty maps. The other reason was the savages. <laughs> Advertisements were sent back to Europe 
promising settlers a new life in a new city that had 24-hour convenience stores, roller coasters, and the entertainment of a nightly hanging at the gallows. All the things civilization had brought to bear on this land. All of Europe wanted to come see what freedom was really like. When they arrived, they were aghast at America's new pastime, watching animals fuck and betting on it. Uh, I, yes, well, this truly was the city of the future. Word spread, so did the settlement. They chose the slender island in the bay, which they called Algonquin, after the old Indian word algon ku win thought by some to mean place for condo skyscraper, and by others as island to catch an STD. In 1625, right after the colony was founded, the first ship of slaves arrived to give the hard-working, morally upstanding, non-hypocritical Americans, newly free from the tyranny of Europe, time to focus on important things in life, like yelling at their women for buying too much shit in the strip mall. The new economy was a boom! It was very different from failed Jamestown, where a bunch of incest-loving cannibals consumed each other in an orgiastic fury of self-important nonsense. Although the exact nature of the differences escapes me just at the moment, but regardless, Liberty City gave the white settlers plenty of time to focus on the important things, like, um, getting laid. The slave craze was huge! It was like, uh, waiting for a new iFruit phone to come out. People would line up at the docks and wait in line for days to own their very own person, and then put them online for a higher price. Some dissenters wondered about the moral consequences of a nation founded on genocide, slavery, and theft, but they were quickly imprisoned as being unpatriotic by proto-chicken hawks. Of course, we have very different values now. That year, all the local indigenous tribes were brought together and paid for what would be the greatest real estate deal in the history of the world. 14,000 acres of prime downtown real estate for some spare change, a porno magazine, and front row tickets for a game of cricket. Cricket is the most boring game ever. What do the British know about sports? They're all gay. The Dutch had a land of plenty. They traded beaver skins, a 17th century version of wife swapping, and partied late into the night. But founding a country on getting shit-faced and working slaves was trouble from the start. It hadn't worked for the Greeks, and it wouldn't work for the Dutch. 4,000 miles from home and no internet connection to read up on soccer scores, the populace became disenchanted. And the colony's deep-seated racism and love of 24-hour shopping would begin to prove to be its undoing. What happens when you take a whole chicken, pack it full of mashed potatoes, top it full of gravy, insert some corn, then deep fry it? You've got yourself a meal! The all-new Stuff Pollo Toto Frito, now at Cluck and Bell. The meal in one just got massive. Cluck and Bell. Liberty City, you don't need money to drive away at Sully's. How about the Ferracci? Here's a fine racing machine for you. There's been a lot of special moments in this beauty. So special, there was an Amber Alert issued. They never found her, but it's yours for $7,999. Enjoy the power of the open road today. Oh boy, Sully's got a nice one for you here! The Emperor! Fast as hell! And the airbags have been successfully tested by the previous three owners! None of them are in the state to drive anymore, so the car is yours now for the low price of $12,999! Sully's has trucks too! The EXT! Nothing makes you feel manly like driving a truck covered in another man's blood! It's got dark upholstery that doesn't show stains! It's a forensics dream! We call it the Science of Crime Special! Only $10,499! Head down to Sully's Auto Mart right now! These and other bargains are going fast! Remember, Sully says it's pre-owned, it's not used! Liberty City, a town on the edge 
a town at the daybreak of dawn, a city at the gate of the universe, a city at the limit of metaphor, deep into the point where hyperbole becomes gibberish. The gateway to the new world was also a terrifying den of iniquity, and the campaign to clean up Liberty City and shut down the Comatoriums began almost as soon as the city was founded. What most people don't know, but what I discovered through extensive reenactments, uh, purely for research of course, was that in the comatoriums they used pig fat as lubrication, which in many ways is far superior to modern day petroleum jelly. Another thing worth bearing in mind is that in the spring of 1647, the East India Trading Company hired a cross-dressing director general for New Rotterdam named uh, Gloria Hole. He had lost his right leg in an unfortunate industrial accident while preaching the good word to some savages by, uh, you know, blowing them up with a cannon, which backfired. Puritanical and self-righteous, he had orders to return civility and productivity to the colony. Within weeks, he had banned drinking, smoking, fornicating with Indians, Texas Hold'em, missing church, anal beads, laughter, and imposed strict fines for male camel toe and whistling in public. It wasn't well received. The city was burned to the ground. Within a few years, New Rotterdam had become so diverse that the Dutch had become a minority in their own colony. Then, just like today, nobody paid attention to the Dutch and only passed through to get stoned or screw a hooker while pretending that they were going there to look at the depressing paintings and smelly stagnant waterways and wooden shoes. Diversity was troubling, and with diversity comes chaos as we know to our peril today. Nietzsche said that, and he was so clever he ended up in a lunatic asylum. Then, leaders began to fear the worst. They were totally petrified of the Jews showing up. Taxes were reduced so everyone could afford their own firearm. And um, a pattern for the country was now set in stone. Ignorant, scared xenophobes armed to the teeth trying to protect their borders. <sighs> it's always been a great nation. What? I'm not racist. On August 27th, 1664, heavily armed British warships entered the harbor. The colonists signed a petition requesting to be ruled by the British so they wouldn't have to brush their teeth any longer and could be certain they were better than everyone else. The English quickly renamed New Rotterdam Liberty City after a generous donation by the Bank of Liberty for sponsorship rights. Every single place the British population went, the invisible hand of God prepared space for them by well, you know, conveniently destroying and eradicating the native population. Soon the colony expanded, and areas were named after heavily inbred members of their Germanic royal family. Broker was named after Sir William Broker III, the king's bastard son, who was conceived by a milkmaid. The region to its north was called Dukes after the word Dukey, as the people in the area smelled like shit. The peninsula to the north of that was named Bohan, after Bohan, a Dutch word meaning Dutch word. And the area across the river was dubbed Alderney, after Philip de Alderney, who was the only person who could tolerate living in an oily, mosquito-filled swamp full of industrial wastelands and soccer mounds. But things wouldn't be quiet for long. Pretty soon, the residents of Liberty City began to fight with the British over taxes. Americans felt, and well, rightly so, that they shouldn't have to pay any taxes. Let the market sort it out. Poor people will die, rich people will win. Welcome to progress. And so began the American Revolution. A bloody battle by men and women who wanted to leave the tyranny of England's tax structure that paid for burdensome health care and unnecessary public education. This was a war agitated by a number of musket companies who knew they would win whatever the outcome. And of course you can still see that rich tradition today. Americans don't want health care or education. No, no, we want guns and fireworks shows and wars so politicians can invest in armament companies and clean up. 
And of course we want drugs. Oh, yes, lots of those. Strong ones you take with young coeds when discussing their thesis and then begin to rub their thighs while they say, didn't I hear you on that documentary? And you whisper to them until they pass out. Uh, uh, but I digress. The American Revolution was bloody. Soon the French joined in the war to help the struggling American insurgency. <laughs> no, they did not. Yes, they did. They joined in by sending a big statue, which won us the war when the British all died laughing at a giant Martian transvestite eating an ice cream cone. Whatever! We saved their asses in WW2. Get me some freedom fries! The Revolutionary War quickly ended. Residents pulled down the statue of King George and melted it into gold chains, gold teeth, and golden toilet seats. The Union Jack was taken down in Liberty City, replaced with the Stars and Stripes, and the newly liberated Americans celebrated. Soon this entrepreneurial spirit took hold, and Liberty City was unstoppable. Yes, although they were free, the people lived in squalor. You could buy a young boy on the streets for, um, you know, a few pence. It was a great time to be in the top 5% of the population. <sighs> it was a great time to be white. Yes, but soon meddlers like Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson came in to change the successful agrarian-based slave economy to one of excessive service fees for concert tickets and huge turnpike tolls. With slavery soon outlawed in Liberty City and the other northern colonies, righteous women were forced to spend time under the train tracks, servicing men for three pence. Oh. You can get your knob slob for less than the price of a donut. It was a nation on the up. The politicians were having a field day. You couldn't get them to vote because they were all out having their knob slobbed. To keep the country moving forward, the capital of the nation was moved from Liberty City to a malaria swamp on the banks of the Potomac, miles to the south. Thankfully, the politicians moved out of Liberty City and the stage was set for organized crime and mobs to really make a difference. The city soon became, well, a microcosm of all the contrasting elements of modern life. Palaces, self-extravagance, squalor, tenements, trannies, men, women and children crowded together like a nest of cockroaches. Just like the Liberty City of today, only with less rich hedge fund dorks trying to be homeboys. With tensions rising and civil war on the horizon, Frederico Fitzpatrick planned to head off and teach the South a lesson. But before doing so, continued his great project to bring calm and civilization to all. A central repository for the most hopeless specimens of degraded humanity to get high in. A park in the middle of Liberty City that would become the great democratic meeting ground where, no matter how rich or how poor, you could get dragged into the bushes and raped. Ah! Yet beyond its tranquil borders, tension was breaking out. A lot of people were tired of living in black and white. They wanted color, and there were riots. There were kids, kids sleeping in the streets, begging, willing to do anything for a nickel. And there were no taboos or TV shows to catch you doing what is natural between a man and a boy. The nation was sliding inexorably into civil war, which we'll leave until next time. Unless you have the foresight to pre-order the box set of DVDs, Join us next time for A History of Liberty Part 2, The Civil War and Beyond. CMT Wednesday nights this fall. Don't miss the return of Funeral Factor, American Asshole, and a whole new shitty singer competition. This is CMT. Tonight, in a time of unimaginable wealth and poverty, incredible drunkenness, and immigrants gone wild, the city of the future takes a look in the mirror of the past and says, what the fuck are you looking at? And then exposes itself in public. Yes, 
the remarkable story of Liberty City continues in A History of Liberty Part 2, Building Big, Ripping People Off. Major support for this series is brought to you by the Bank of Liberty, who say, thanks for the bailout, America. We needed to make yacht payments and to keep our offshore accounts topped up. If you look at the faces that make up the palette of Liberty City today, literally millions of faces of different hue and tone and hairiness from all corners of the earth, seething with hate, raging with fear, boiling with anger at the high prices, corrupt police, and strippers with annoying Russian accents, then it can seem like not much has changed in Liberty City in 150 years. Still, they came in hordes to a place that hates you as soon as you arrive, and that attitude is what makes Liberty City the remarkably putrid yet insanely overpriced metropolis it is today. We continue our epic story of A History of Liberty. My uh, great-great-grandfather, Seamus, uh, left Ireland in 1825 and arrived by boat in Liberty City. He was stunned. Uh, I mean, he'd, he'd heard about this, this magical place with, like, gold coins and gay unicorns and a lot of rainbows and, like, policemen who didn't wear any trousers, but what he actually found was this, this sweatshop construction job. In those days, things were very different, you know. Uh, construction workers actually worked, instead of drinking during lunch and setting up inflatable rats and sexually assaulting strangers. Nice tits! You're disgusting! By 1830, Liberty City was being flooded with Irish immigrants who were told that American girls were easy to get into bed when they heard a foreign accent. Yeah, it's true. The birds are easy. My family's lived in America for generations, and it's because of my pride and heritage and desperation for some kind of identity that I fake this accent all the time. Soon, the trickle of Irish immigration became a flood. The Irish, who were so busy drinking and chasing rainbows and sleeping with midgets, forgot how to grow potatoes. A famine spread across the land. How do you mess up growing potatoes, for crying out loud? It's a tuber, for goodness sake. One-eighth of Ireland's population came to Liberty City in about, oh, 15 minutes. Local businessmen loved it. Finally, they had found them a group of people they could pay less than they pay the blacks. It's about competition, a free market. Just like today, some people look down on the Irish. Streets at night were full of ruffians. Riots broke out every evening. There were working-class riots against the upper class. Anti-Irish riots, anti-black riots, anti-English riots, soccer riots, pacifist riots, girl-on-girl -girl hot riots. Before the invention of television, most people had nothing more interesting to do of an evening than setting fire to their neighbors. At the same time, you begin to see this incredible migration from the south, migrating just like birds, shitting on everything and making too much noise. People from the south headed up to Liberty City because they'd heard now, hey, there's this place that's even more racist than where we live. And you can go there and hate people from all over the world, freely and openly, like a true American. The energy of the city would break over you like a fat woman climaxing a sweaty, heaving mass that cannot be stopped, a disgusting, sticky, and smelly underbelly screaming in your ear, drowning your soul, and afterwards you feel terrible about yourself and promise never to drink again, hoping no one saw the disgusting trollop you left the bar with. You going out, baby? To satisfy the carnal desires of the population, the city's first newspapers appeared in the late 1830s. Residents instantly demanded less political coverage, preferring stories of moral degeneracy, crime, sex, muggings, and especially rapes, which were always on page three. The Liberty Tree published its first edition in 1835, and every time they would expose how dishonest politicians were robbing people blind, the public would criticize the media for institutional bias. Anyone who badmouths politicians or big business has an agenda. Idiot liberals, usually drug users and 
open homosexuals, always unduly concerned about the truth. Scared of being left out of all the fun, early bankers showed they could destabilize society as well as anyone. In 1857, the markets of the exchange collapsed. You had huge panic in the financial district as everyone realized a bunch of assholes in suits had duped America with a giant pyramid scheme in which they made out like bandits and everybody else got shit on. The poor got poorer and there was no Social Security or Medicare to help people. Yes, sir, those were truly grand times when we let the weak die in the streets rather than prop them up. It's what America's all about. Every man for himself and steal what you can when no one's looking. To help the city feel better about itself, one of the largest public works projects in history came to completion. Middle Park. Oh yeah, it was really remarkable. They took a patch of open land and put a wall around it and spent a lot of public money calling it a park. The park was another example of unparalleled American ingenuity. Copy something from Europe and pretend you invented it. The builders of Middle Park hoped that the classes could now mingle and buy drugs from each other. However, African Americans were excluded from the park entirely. Oh, I don't have that. What? Yeah. I didn't say anything. No, not much. You know, only elegant carriages were allowed. Working class vehicles like lowriders and hybrids were barred entirely. The park had a list of rules a mile long. No picnics, blowjobs, walking on the grass, camp exercise, no baseball by schoolboys, and creepy old men were given an entire section where they could roll their balls around. But broker residents had a problem. Rowing to work across the Humboldt River was abysmal, and rowing home drunk resulted in many naval accidents. Plus, local manic depressives complained there was nothing tall enough to jump off and kill yourself. Mm. So construction began on the Broker Bridge. It was a boom for organized crime, who ensured that non-union workers were taken care of, and gave entrepreneurial residents of Liberty City a new place to dump bodies. At the same time, a dark cloud was growing over the fledgling nation. The rise of Liberty City was a menace to the southern way of life. Focusing on education, arts, interacting with people of other races was such a threat to the incredible civilization of the South that some states began to consider seceding from the Union. These were true patriots. They loved America so much, they wanted to leave it. Some residents of Liberty City were southern sympathizers during the Civil War. They liked the idea of drinking a 12-pack of crap beer each night, eating at breakfast buffets, and listening to rock bands that played two-hour guitar solos. In 1863, the first draft was announced to bolster northern troops. The citizens were enraged, drunk and angry, armed with iron bars, ninja swords, survival knives, and Chinese stars. The draft riots began. An emergency message was sent out by a telegram. Then, the telegraph lines were cut. The wealthiest nation in the world was in anarchy. And not the good kind of anarchy, where you cop a feel in the mosh pit at a punk rock concert. Mobs formed. And to show the South that they had nothing on being two-faced bigots, Rioters in Liberty City went and burned down an orphanage full of black children. People misunderstand. What? Well, it's a culture of heritage, not hate. You can see that in our Civil War reenactments in the park. We reach out to the black community, but nobody is interested in learning about history by getting the tar whooped out of them and then set on fire and shot. Strange, really, when you think of it. Yeah, it's strange, all right, huh? Nobody wants to spend a Saturday in the park getting lynched by dorks wearing tunics. Soon, horrible liberal musicians made protest songs, asking America, Civil War, what is it good for? And America said, we don't have TV yet, so it keeps things interesting. The Civil War was the crossroads of our nation, and at that crossroads was a truck stop, a fireworks stand, 
and a place to buy rebel flag souvenirs and lighters with naked ladies on them. And one of those machines where you put in a quarter and that claw comes down and tries to pick up a stuffed pig, but it never really does. So you go out to your truck and a lot lizard is out there and she says, I'll blow you for $20. And you let her. Then you kill her and burn the body. That's the American experience in a nutshell. The reason this war lasted for years was it took so damn long to pack a rifle. You know, we Southerners move slow and methodically. We chat a bit, tell a racist joke, go fishing, pack a rifle, take a nap. And sometime in the afternoon, you know, when you get around to it, you try to find you a Yankee or colored person to shoot. We never had a chance, really. But we'll rise again, I promise you that. After quite a few years of hard fighting and cheap novels and terrible speeches, the war was over. Everyone could go back to the peacetime pursuits of mutual self-loathing and throwing bags full of turds and freaks. It was a time of leisure and rebuilding in the North as carpetbaggers had destroyed the great civilization of the South. A civilization they misunderstood terribly. Ha! The reason they're called red states is because of the bloodshed trying to get a bunch of hillbillies to act like decent human beings. Uh, okay. Residents wanted to relax after having won the war and celebrating with massive tailgate parties. So the new art of leisure began in Firefly Island, a quiet seaside district that featured hot dog eating competitions condoms floating in the surf, and roller coasters that derailed and maimed people. Plus, freak shows where you could point and laugh and make dwarves and hairy women cry. Oh, that one's my favorite. Ah, oh. with the war over, residents of Liberty City returned to amusing themselves by binge drinking, swimming with their clothes on, and watching magic shows where people would search for a tiny man hidden in a woman's nether regions. Liberty City has always been full of massive cunts, after all. <laughs> for once, I agree. And the city began work on a new project for its leisure class. A place of orgies and depravity, drug addiction and perversity, anxiety and sweat. The Liberty City Subway. Nothing unified residents of a city more than being squashed into one another on a subway train as they rushed from one important appointment at the hat makers to another at the witch burning. It's disgusting. People mixing together like some great cosmopolitan clusterfuck. Preserve differences. My leg is going numb just thinking about it. Liberty City went crazy for underground trains. The first station opened in 1874 and was inaugurated by throwing buckets of urine on the platforms. People loved it, although there was nowhere to go, as the first train did not get built for another five years, so they had to wait in the station for a very long time. So with this and the Broker Bridge, people were free to live in the suburbs and realize the joys of commuting. Apathy, alienation, shitty radio morning shows, and car key parties. And they were allowed to live amongst their own kind in the suburbs and feel safe. Even then, bridge and tunnel was a dirty word, just like flange. Ooh, has somebody, anybody seen my medication for my angina? I mean you, boy. What's your name? Excuse me? Oh, be quiet. I didn't mean nothing by it. Come on. Get over yourself. Hey, I can laugh at myself. What's wrong with you people? Seriously, I have angina. I could die of a heart attack any second. Where's my medication? I'll bet you stole it just to get high. Say what? Are you hillbilly? Uh, with that, the island of Algonquin was free to grow into the capital of a massive metropolis to expand beyond its borders. So what did they do? They built massive skyscrapers and looked down in the other boroughs, of course. Is there a doctor in there? Boy, get me a doctor, please. Ah! Oh. <laughs> Ignorant cracker. Uh... Just like today, it was a city of birth and death, of decay and renewal, of double-headers and double-enders. Finally, 
Liberty City was beginning to take its modern form. Overcrowded, smelly, but impressive and grandiose. Full of rich, unhappy people and poor, greedy people. All living cheek by jowl, like swine in a pen. But the city wasn't out of the woods yet. Soon, something would be invented that would change cities forever. Which we'll leave for next time on A History of Liberty.